Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. You guys are all here, hopefully, to learn how to build web apps that integrate with ArcGIS Online and Portal. Uh, my name is Kelly Hutchins. I am a product engineer on the JavaScript team. I mostly work building configurable apps that are available in ArcGIS Online. Um, and I'm presenting with my colleague, Heather Gonzaga, who is a product engineer on the JavaScript team. Uh, on this main slide, we have a link to the GitHub repository that has the sample application that we're going to build and the slides that we're showing, so you can access all that information later. <clears throat> okay, a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. We'll do like a brief, I think, two-slide intro to build, uh, you know, apps and how they integrate with ArcGIS Online and Portal. And then we'll talk about... Um, web maps and web scenes a little bit in the process of building this application that integrates portal content. So we thought about the best way to present this information and we thought that it might be easiest to convey everything we have to convey by going through the process of just building a sample application that uses a lot of the things that are available to us as developers. <clears throat> So some of the advantages of working with ArcGIS Online and Portal um, is that it's an easy way to share and manage your resources. So you could create a web map with some hosted feature layers in it, and you can use it in a web app builder application. You could use it in a configurable app. You could build a custom application with it and take advantage of all of the capability. You can have someone in your organization um, design the symbology for the map and configure the pop-up and then save it out and give you the ID and you can use it to build apps. So it's a great way to share that information easily. Less code, I'm always a fan of writing less code. We'll see later how using a web map or scene means that we write less code. So this is sort of just a reiteration. There's a lot of different kinds of apps, mobile solutions, web applications that are available hosted in ArcGIS Online, like the Web App Builder and configurable applications, and custom applications that you build that can all be based on ArcGIS Online content, like web maps, web scenes, and group content. So we'll do a quick overview of the resources that are available to you in the SDK. The first one I think that's helpful is this guide topic that Heather wrote on how to work with the ArcGIS platform. So it's got lots of information. If you're new to ArcGIS Online or Portal, you can come here and read a little bit of information about what it is and how to work with it in the API. <clears throat> We also have a ton of samples available. So here I've filtered uh, to show the samples by the keyword portal, and there's eight samples that show how to do various things like load a web map, create a layer from a portal item, and we're gonna go over a lot of this while we build our app. Um, loading a web scene and um, working with authentication. And then finally, the developer site <clears throat> is a good resource for more information on ArcGIS security and authentication. So when we're working with content from ArcGIS Online and Portal, some of it might be secure or premium or subscriber content. So you may need to deal with um, security and authentication. So the way we're going to uh, uh, conduct this presentation, I mentioned, is that we're going to build an app um, and through the process talk to you about the tools you would need to build something similar. So let's take a quick look at this app and what it looks like. And again, the source code for this is available in that GitHub repo. It's not a production ready app, there's no error checking, um, there's a lot of you know, things that are left out of it. But we have sign in so you can authenticate through OAuth. Once you sign in, in this case we get some layers that are available in, I signed in as me, so it looks in my content and pulls out some of the hosted feature layers I have available. And then we display them in this card style format and have a button that lets us add them to the map. In this case, it's a 3D globe. So we add the layer content to it. We also have added some widgets like the base map gallery and the search. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Heather to talk about authentication. So authentication is the fun part. You got to handle your secured, uh, secured resources, perhaps. 
So in this, uh, this particular example that we have Kelly signed in using um, the, the platform OAuth security model that we have. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you through the code exactly how we went ahead and, and, and set this up. So first off, you're gonna wanna go in and register an application with the platform, with the ArcGIS Online platform, or your own portal in your particular, if you're using in that particular case. So what we're gonna do is there's a couple different ways that you can do this. You can do this using the de um, developer, RTS Online, um, RTS Online or the developer's network. So I'm gonna go and use RTS Online. And if you go in, I've already signed in. I'm gonna click on add item. And I'm gonna create a new application. In this case, it's gonna be a web mapping application. I'm just gonna give it a URL and let's grab. And a name. And some meaningful tags. And we're gonna add that. So now we have a new application that was created here in RTS Online. But what I need to do is if you go into the settings, I need to actually register this thing. So down here, if I click on this re register button, I'm gonna say I want this to be a browser app type and I'm gonna give it a redirect URI. So in this particular case, I'm just gonna redirect. The redirect URI is basically gonna be the address of the, the valid addresses of your users that are allowed to access this application when it gets redirected back to once they successfully log in. So this case, I can't even type today, there we go. There we go, all right. So you get an app ID and then you get an app secret. So this would be analogous to just like if you had um, just your username and your password, okay? So your app secret, you wanna keep that secret. I'm not gonna go ahead and show you guys for this particular example. Um, but this app ID, this is what you're gonna wanna take note of because this is what you're gonna use within the OAuth info. There's an OAuth info class within the JavaScript API that you're gonna work with and use to register this and work with this, um, this, this security model. All right. So what I'd like to do is actually look at the code. It makes it a little easier, I think. All right, so the identity manager, we have an identity manager, and the identity manager in the JavaScript APIs, basically it takes all of the complexity of dealing with your secured resources and, and throws it up. It, it makes it easier for you as a developer to, uh, to handle it. So basically what happens is, is if you, it, the way the identity manager works is when you are um, loading up your application, if you get any 404 errors, it hits the secured service, it can't access this, it's going to, that identity manager will prompt you. It automatically will prompt you for your credentials. If you have this registered OAuth, OAuth information associated with that, it will automatically give you that server-side login that Kelly showed you when she showed you that, that finished demo app. So what we have here is we have this register OAuth info and it takes an array of OAuth info class, OAuth info classes. We only have one in this particular case and we're passing in that app ID. So this is a different app ID from one that I've set up to work with both Kelly and my machine. But it'd be the same exact thing if on your end. You create that application ID, um, bring that on in here, and then it would work. It should work as long as you have the redirect URI set up properly. And then basically we're just past, we're, um, uh, wiring up some event listeners, and then um, on our sign, sign in button, and then we call the get credential method off of the identity manager and we pass in the portal URL. So in this case, we're just using the basic arcgis.com forward slash sharing. And what happens then is that once that gets, that prompt resolves, it returns back a credential that we can use and access to access them. All right, so let's take a quick look. I showed you how to do that. 
and I showed you how to do that. Let's take a look at, at the demo. All right, so this is the big fat demo that Kelly initially showed you. We've broke it down into six individual steps. So there's not a lot to this, but basically what we have is this sign in button. I click on it and I'm already signed in on a previous tab here, but if I wasn't, it would give me the username um, and the password that I would have to manually type in. It remembers it from a separate um, tab. I've got RTS Online open, so I'm just gonna go ahead and say yes. Approve it. So now you see my login. So I kind of just gave you a very high level, 10,000 feet above to how you can work with authentication. There's a lot more to it. Um, we are using the named user approach. There's a couple different approaches when working with OAuth. There's the application, pro the application approach, so pretty much like saving out your, um, your application ID and your client secret, you could save that into something like a proxy file and have your application handle those credentials for you so you don't have to have a user log in. Um, but in this particular case, we do want our users to log in. So this is a named user approach and um, there's a lot of information uh, regarding that. And if we go back, just wanna make sure. I think you showed them. If you go to the main developer site, go to documentation, um, you'll see a link there for security and authentication. And there's an enormous amount of information. Um, Patrick and his team have done a really good job putting a lot of this information together. We also have links to it as well within the JavaScript API um, within our SDK underneath the guide topics. So um, yeah. I think that's kind of it in a nutshell, right? Is that the last one? Yeah. Okay, so now in our demo app, we've handled the authentication part. We have a sign-in link at the top and people can sign into our application so that they can eventually, when we get there, access their content. So the next step in our app is we wanna create that map that we were showing, <clears throat> that we were showing in the main area. So the way we create a map in this application is that we're using a web map or a web scene that are created in RTS Online as our starting point. And there's a lot of reasons for doing this. Um, I'll just look at a basic web map sample from the help. It's called Load a Basic Web Map. And if we look at this thing in the sandbox, we can see that there's a lot of comments in here, but there's not a lot of code. This is a really all the code that we have in the application. We just create this new thing called a web map. This could also be a web scene if you wanted working with 3D content. Um, and then we, we provide this portal item and pass in this ID. This ID is the unique identifier for that web map. Once we do that, it's gonna display this map. It's a regular map like any other map in the JavaScript API. We could add additional layers to it if we wanted to. We could zoom to a different location. We can um, work with it like a regular map. But the things that we get, because it's a web map, are if there's pop-up content defined, we get access to that pop-up content. We get the symbology that was defined in the web map. We get the extent it was defined in the web map. And we get a few more things that we'll look at in a second. So it's a nice um, time saver. I don't love writing code for a unique value or a class breaks render. It's a lot of code that you have to write, and it, I find it kind of tedious, so I let uh, the web map do that for me, and I just pull it into my application. So now if we look at our sample app, this is actually the code from step two for our sample app, and we have the same thing going on here. We're creating a new web map, passing in that portal item ID. In our sample, it's just a simple web map with only a base map, because that's all we're displaying is a simple base map. And then we're giving that map to the new scene view. Scene view is what makes this thing 3D. When I showed you the sample app, it was a globe. If I wanted this to be 2D map instead, I could just replace the scene view with map view, and then it would display as a map. So I can show you that. Let's just switch this here. We'll, we'll leave um, the argument's name the same for the sake of time. We'll just change this to import the map view module. And then if I go to my browser, have it up here, refresh it, and I have this 2D map that we're looking at instead of the sample app that's 3D. So it's really easy to create either a 2D or a 3D map.
<clears throat> the unique identifier I mentioned that you pass into the web map through the portal item, people often ask how you get it. We can get it through code by querying the portal for more information. We'll see that in a little bit when we work with the layers. But it's also available in the URL bar. So if you open your web map in the Arctis Online Map Viewer or the Arctis Online Item Detail page, there's this ID equals or web map equals value. And that lawn ID, that's the ID that you, that you need to use to access that layer or map or scene or group content. It's available in the URL. Some other stuff that's actually stored in the web map and web scene that's available to us as developers are bookmarks and slides, and both of those can come in handy. We have samples in the help that are linked to here, so let's take a look at the bookmarks first. <clears throat> so the bookmarks, we have the API reference here. There's a link in the API reference to a sample that uses the bookmarks widget. And I'm gonna bring it up in the sandbox so we can easily look at the code. So bookmarks, if you're not familiar with them, are just saved, ex named saved extents that you save in the web map. So this one, it looks like it's parks in Redlands and you can quickly zoom to those different places. You define those in the ArcGIS Online web map, save the web map, and that information is stored with it and access accessible to us as developers. <clears throat> so it's pretty easy to get that information it's actually with the bookmarks widget, which is what the sample uses, all you have to do is create a new bookmarks widget and pass it the view that's using that web map. It knows how to read that web map and see if it has the bookmarks content, and if it does, it just plops it in the widget for you. So it's a pretty simple process. With slides in the web scene, it's the same thing. So we have this example of the slide tour so this one is a bunch of slides that were defined in this 3D um, scene view. And this is a tour that's gonna slowly go through. Um, you guys can check out the sample later, but let's look at the code. And as we go, it's gonna, let's start the tour and it will hopefully keep going through. <clears throat> so here we have a web scene pointing to that unique identifier. And then in this case, we just look at the scene after it's loaded and we get the presentation slides. So this gives us access to all the slides. There's not a corresponding widget. So in this example, they're just looping through the array of slides and creating this uh, information and a button to display on a div for each slide. So that information that people create in the scene viewer is also available to developers. So here's our stage two of the map. We still have the sign in link that still works, and now we have our 3D globe that's available to us. So now I'm gonna pass it back to Heather and she's gonna get us connected to the portal. Okay, so we've authenticated, we've added a map, now we actually need to connect to whatever portal it is that we need to connect to. In our particular case, it's just gonna be ArcGIS.com. So when we talk about the portal, basically what we're, we have a bunch of portal classes that we have created for you within the API. Basically these classes um, take this, the functionality that is provided within the REST API and we've made convenience classes for it. We don't have all of it, 80% say? For the most part, we have a good chunk though. So first things first, if we take a look at the portal class, it's located in Esri portal uppercase portal, this threw me off a couple times the first time I started, first couple times I started playing around with it. Gives a pretty good write-up of everything, but as you'll notice here, just by the size of our scroll bar, how much is actually in this guy, and how much we can actually access from this. So the properties that we can access from the portal itself is basically what you're gonna get when you call the portal self API call. So for those of you who may not be familiar, when I, we talk about the REST API for Portal, if you go to the developer site, 
and I believe it's under, it's just under the rest doc. Yeah, it's just under, you'll, you'll, it'll give you breakdowns of the different APIs. If you just go to the rest API, it's gonna be under the user groups and items. And I had it, the portal self call. So basically what our classes are doing, our convenience classes, portal just being the main one here, what we're doing under the hood is that we're actually making these portal API calls. We're using the portal API with, within these classes and we're getting access to all of the, um, the response properties. Okay, so what you see here for the most part, not all, but for the most part, you're gonna get what you see here, you're going to get listed as properties within your portal class. So within our code, we have a load method and basically all we're doing is we're creating a new instance of the portal and we're gonna go ahead and load that up. So again, like I mentioned before, it makes this self call. And just to kind of show you, for some of you that may like to geek out on some of this stuff, um, I like to open up the dev tools a lot when I'm working with this just to kind of see what's actually happening underneath the hood. So you can do this in any of your browsers. I have Chrome up, so I'm just gonna open up, open up the dev tools in this case. And go into my network traffic. And let's try. And close that out. Got too much in here, go to the self call. All right, so there's a lot of stuff in here. But if I open that up in a new tab, we can see here this response that gets, that gets generated just from that self call. And that's basically what we have and what we see if you take a look at this, um, this REST API, okay? So it's making that self call and then that response that you get back, and it's all listed here. You can see that as well, like if you go in and take a look within your network traffic. Don't have to, but it's kind of, if you're troubleshooting, you can kind of take a look and see where things are going. All right, so all we have here is just a little um, snippet just showing a few of the um, various properties that you can access off of the portal. Oh, and another thing as well, and I, I wanna uh, touch on it, is we have these helper services too. So the portal gives us um, access to things like if you have a custom print service, um, custom routing services, things like that. Any of that stuff that you may have saved within your portal, you can access that as well. All right, so let's go ahead and take a quick look. All right, so if I sign in. So right now, let's go back. Right now, I was anonymous, so not signed in, and so all we're seeing here is just explore, explore portal, all right? So if I sign in, Now you'll notice here, it takes the, um, the org name, of the, the organization name of my portal that I'm working in, and passes it in here to the, um, the, uh, the header, the title. If we take a look at the code, you'll see here there's not a whole lot to it. I'm asynchronous, asynchronously um, going in here and I'm loading this portal up. So I'm creating a new portal, and I'm waiting for this portal to load. And then basically all it's doing is once the portal is loaded, it's sending that app title to whatever, in my case it was um, Explore JS API. If it was anonymous, then it was just Explore um, Portal. Okay. I'm sorry, you, you asked what was the function? I Okay, yeah, so you're asking which the function that I called on the sign-in? 
okay, so, oh, the get credentials. So his question was, what was I actually, what function was being called when I clicked on the sign in? So we had the get credentials. Okay, and then what I'm doing there is I'm passing in that credential. So what we have is we have, we're, as we're saying, hey, if this credential is, um, if, it's, if it's true, if it's not true, we're gonna go ahead, get the credential, pass in that portal URL, we'll access it from there. We're then gonna go ahead, um, get that uh, username, and we're passing that username. So you notice when I click the sign in, it updated to Heather underscore JS9. That's basically all we're doing here. Yeah, and there's, like I said, you can get, um, we're kind of, we only have a little bit of time, but that's why we give you guys the links to the repo, so you can go in there and kind of dig through some of it and just, you know, break it apart and play around with it to, you know, to kind of figure out how things are working. Did you want to add any more to no, that? That's good. Okay. All right. Okay, cool. Okay, so Heather's gotten us all connected to the portal, so I'm gonna show us now how to query the portal and get content. But I guess I wanted to say one thing about that um, code sample that's out there on the GitHub repo. We wrote that using um, ES6, so there's a lot of things that if you're used to working with ES5 JavaScript, you might not have seen before, so there's async await, fat arrow functions, template literals. Um, we have it set up to work with Babel, so it transpiles it or compiles it back to ES5, so it should work in all the supported browsers, IE 11 and up, Edge, Chrome, Firefox. So if you start digging around in the code and you notice some things that look weird, it's uh, ES6 syntax, so. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna talk about querying the portal content. So there's a bunch of different ways, that methods that we can use to query and access portal content. We can query for groups, so you can call this query groups content and get back information about the groups that you have in your organization, and then you can get content from that group. So here we can see we have portal.query groups, and at the bottom we have portal group.query items. So you can query the group, and then you could get items from that group. We also can get items directly from the portal, so we can query items directly if we're just interested in a particular item or a set of items that meet some criteria. You can query for users within your organization, so you can find a particular user or a group of users. <clears throat> and you can also query favorites. Once you get a user, you can query for the favorites. So we'll just pick one of these, like query items, and look at the API reference for them. So we can see that query items takes in query params. <clears throat> the query params are available as portal query params. So let's look at that really quickly. So here we have portal query, uh, portal query parameters. There are lots of properties that you can pass into the constructor. We have the information here, including categories, if you wanna look for particular categories an extent if you want that search to be within an extent of, that you supply, a number, so you can say I only want to get back five results or 10 results or 100 results, you can determine that number. A query stream, so that's when you pass in, maybe you're looking for hosted feature layers or an, all items with the word fire in their title, you can do that in the query. You can pass in a sort field and a sort order. So you wanna get them back sorted in ascending order on the date field. You can also get back um, the start, the index of the first entry in that result set. And you can use this to do paging, paging through the, the um, results that you get back. So here's an example, I'm actually gonna show you in the code, because this is like, I think a lot to look at on a slide. <clears throat> Sorry, I have too many windows open. So we have in our code that we're gonna query item from the portal. So here, hide this. Here's our call to query items. So we say portal.query items. We're using this async await syntax. So basically this is um, saying wait until this query is done. When it's done, we get the results back and display them as item results. But in this case, we only want items within the view extent. So we're getting the current extent of our view and we're using that as a query parameter. And then we're also using this query option. 
This query is defined up here. So what we're saying is if there's a user logged in, set the owner property, so we're adding that to the query, we're setting the owner property to that user, so I wanna get back items for m me, my user, and then I want to um, get these layer types. And what I'm doing in this application is only getting back layer information. We don't want map views or scene views or anything. I just wanna get hosted feature layers. So there's this whole um, bit of nonsense we have to do here where we wanna say we get back feature collections or feature services or map services, but we don't wanna get back code attachments or featured items or symbol sets or color sets or all of this other stuff. So it's kind of a long query. Um, and then this is saying if I'm not logged in, if there's no user, just query for feature layers that are available. So this application, if someone's logged in, it'll get back their content, it'll query their content. If no one is logged in, it's just gonna query for some feature layer items and display those. The syntax for the query streams is documented in the, um, in the, I'll show you the link from the help. Yes, it's a good question. <clears throat> so here's a link to the query, and in the JavaScript API reference, if you look at the query, there's a link to the REST API search reference. So I'll open that in a link in a new tab, and that's the ArcGIS REST API. So you can see um, there's information on the various ways you can construct the query like date searches, and here's an example of the owner search. So that's all available in here. We can show them at the end, too. Yeah, we can talk about this more at the end if you have more questions, but that was a good question. <clears throat> okay, so now we've got those query results back. We queried for items within the extent that are owned by me, that are of type feature layer. <clears throat> we get them back at the end of our query, and we're ready to display them. So let's look at the source code again. So here, remember I said this uh, uh, item results is gonna display the results from my query when it comes back, so I get those query results back. And I can call this display items function and pass in those results, so the results are passed into it. And then let me close this window up. <clears throat> so what's going on here is that we, um, we have this array of items, these are the results. So I'm using this map, which is an array method. So basically it's letting me loop through each result item. So each layer that's found, I'm gonna loop through each result. And then I'm gonna create this little HTML um, object, which is that card that we saw on the page. So there's some divs in here. And we can see that we have an image tag and we're using the thumbnail URL that comes back from the item. And then we have the title, which is displayed on there. And then we have the item ID, which we're associating with this button. So when somebody clicks on this add to layer button, we've got this item ID that we're gonna use in the next step that Heather talks about. So just to recap, this is just looping through each of those results and constructing this little HTML template and filling it in with pieces of information that we're getting back from that item. So let's look at this again. Now that we've seen what's going on in the code, we can take a quick look. We notice that when I first uh, log in, I'm not signed in. I get back some generic items that are just available in ArcGIS Online. They have nothing to do with me. I sign in as me. And once I do the content that comes back changes, this is content that's available that I've created that's available in my content. And I can see that for each of the things that come back, I think I uh, asked for 10 results back, I get the thumbnail that's displayed, the title, and this little button that we created with that HTML template that we've added to this container that's displayed on the side of our page. Clicking at this point, we haven't hooked up this add to map button, so I could click this all day and nothing happens, but that's uh, what Heather's gonna show you in just a minute. <clears throat> So yeah, we're gonna to switch to Heather and she's gonna show you how to add that layer. All right, let me get back in here. Okay, so the next step 
Basically, all we're needing to do is we're just wiring up a click event handler for, um, for these buttons, okay? So we have two steps to this. We're going in, we're iterating through each of those, um, the buttons that we have listed there within the, uh, that scroll down the, the left-hand side. And then we're grabbing the, the IDs from each of those. And then we're also calling this add layer to map function. So let's go ahead and just open this up. It's easier to see it from here. So what we have is it's calling this add, add layer to map. And what it's doing is, is we have this method in the, um, the 4X API called from portal item. Do you guys, who, who here has, who works in 3X? Anybody? 3X? 4X? Yeah? Okay, so in 3X, you can bring in your web maps. Um, you know, you can, you, can create a, you can create maps from your web map. You can bring it in using the, um, the unique ID. But you couldn't bring in feature layers. In 4, it's awesome. You can do this. So you can have hosted layers on RTS Online or with, you know, within your portal. You can grab that unique ID and create your own, create a feature layer, in our particular case, create a feature layer using that hosted layer that you have, in this case, on RTS Online. So we have just off of the layer class, there's this from portal item. We're passing in the item that we're, we're sending, we're passing in here using the, on the add layer to map function. And then what we're doing is we're watching, so we have um, a way within um, the 4X API that allows you to watch for property changes. So we're saying, hey, I want you to watch for the load status property off of this layer class. And once that status is loaded, we're gonna go ahead and I want you to use the, there's a go to method off of the view, the view. it'll automatically zoom then to that the, the extent. Okay, so we're passing in the extent off of this go-to method. So, and then we're adding the layer. So let's go ahead here and take a quick look. Sign in. Oh my goodness. This is when I wish they didn't have us do strong passwords anymore. It'd be easier. Just like I said. All right. So now we've connected to the portal, we've authenticated, we've added our map, we've connected to the portal, we've um, queried my user, queried me, and you can see here I've got a, you can see I've been doing a lot of testing. So I'm just gonna go ahead and add, I have one, this ecological footprint. So now I actually can click on this button. And you can see here, adds the layer to this map and then it zooms to the location of that layer's extent. Anything else you wanted to add to that? Uh, that's good. All right. Cool. Kelly is gonna bring it home with some widgets. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, working with some widgets in the JavaScript API that are available that um, know how to integrate with portal content. So we have two examples here. One is a base map gallery and one is a search widget. And I'm actually going to go back to the source code. <clears throat> so in this application, we can see that we have the base map gallery here and we have the um, search widget here above it that we're adding to our globe, our scene view in this case. Uh, we, in, in both of these examples, we've passed in the portal. So this passes in the portal URL, and by doing that, we get some nice features. If you pass in the portal to the search, and your org has locators defined on it, you get those locators in your search widget. So we'll look at that in the sample app. So let me, I think this is step six. I'm gonna run, oh no, let go, let me go to the sample. <clears throat> You can tell it's the end of the day. Okay. So I'm going to run this again. And I can look, let me sign out. 
I can look and see that if I look at the search widget, by default, the world locator is hooked up to it. I could type in, you know, San Diego, and I get uh, suggestions, and I can zoom to San Diego, and that's great. But let's say my organization has a specific locator associated with it and set in the org properties. By passing in that portal value, I get this extra drop down and I can see that my org locators are also available here, which is nice because that's another piece of code I don't like writing is all the code for accessing a feature layer search source or a new locator search source. So if you've got it already configured and you just want to use it in your app, pass in that portal URL. Same thing with the base map gallery. By default, the base map gallery shows a set of base maps, but if you have a custom base map group defined in your organization and you pass in that portal URL, it's gonna use that custom group in that base map gallery. In this case, you know, we don't have a special group defined. I'm gonna show you one more time that self call that Heather mentioned. So this is just that general view of the portal depending on if you're logged in or not. If you're not logged in, this self-call has the defaults, the anonymous helper services, the anonymous base map gallery, et cetera. Once you sign in, you can see your custom base map gallery. So if you have one, this is that group. This is the property that we're gonna read from with the base map gallery. And down here in helper services, I can see that I have that San Diego locator and I also have that San Jose locator, and these were defined in that self-call. So when I pass it in, this is sort of behind the scenes, when I pass in that portal URL, it reads the information from here, and it uses it to populate those values in the search widget. So this way you can give a custom experience depending on who's logged in. They log into your app, they get their org locators. <clears throat> So we already saw the demo, we saw that we could add the widget and it's gonna add in, or add the portal URL and it's gonna add in our custom information for us. Did you wanna talk about this request? Okay. Or do you want me to I mean, Well, he mentioned, he was asking about the, um, the, the query, so I know that that little demo that we have in there, in here. Has, it, has that in there, so we can show that if you'd like. Yeah, so in most cases, you can work with the portal content using the classes available in the JavaScript API. Sometimes you need to do something that might not be available. You can use Ezra request to make the query and call the underlying REST API, which has access to a bunch of information, and you can do it sort of the, the um, more low-level way. So here's the link to that portal REST API. We showed it to you just a minute ago. There's lots of information here about lots of different um, uh, information that you can access, you can do search, and you can get item content. All the stuff we did with the API classes, you could also, if you wanted to, do it with Ezra request and the portal REST API. So you could go at that low-lying level if you needed to. You should explore the portal documentation just to see what's available to you there. I think that's good. Hmm? I think that's good. Never mind, go ahead. Did you have something you wanted to say? No, you're good. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, you're good. Uh, okay, so we have just a really simple demo here. We click get items and it gets back some information. It's not formatted nicely or anything. This is just a quick uh, down and dirty sample. Let's look at the source code. We can see that it loads as we request. We can see that we define the URL to the sharing REST search. So that's this REST API URL that we need. We create a query, so here, we're creating a query, we're specifying that we want 10 results back. We're looking for owner Heather and this particular folder. So this is sort of a similar query to what we were doing before where we're looking for a particular owner. <clears throat> and then we make this as a request call, we pass in the URL and the query, and then we get the response and we do something with the response. Here we're just looping through those results the results array, similar to the way we did it in the other example, and here we're just displaying them in a div. So not fancy, but this is, I think, a good tool to have in your tool belt for cases where you need something that's not available um, through the JSAPI classes. I was gonna say, don't even worry about the other stuff. Just go to the end. Okay, it's up to you. Do you wanna talk about that? 
Yeah, the one other tool I guess I should show, how many people here already use the AGO Assistant? A lot of people, if you haven't used it, let's see if I have a link to it here. AGO Assistant, looks like my link got messed up. Uh, okay, so the eight, yeah. AGO Assistant's here. I can log into my organization. And what we can do is, uh, let me see if I can find a web map that I have. <clears throat> Here's a web map. I want to view an items JSON. So then I have this web map selector, this item selected, and you can actually look at the underlying JSON because really all a web map or a web scene is, is JSON with information about what you've specified in, in ArcGIS Online. So here we have the ID is available here. You can find out the owner, when it was created, um, thumbnail information, a whole bunch of detail. And then you can see the data that's the information about the actual web map. So in this case, we have the layers available inside that map, the pop-up info that they've defined on that web map layer. A lot of JSON. You can actually edit it. Be careful, make sure you know what you're doing if you edit it, because you can mess up your web map. But I think it's sometimes useful to come here and use this to actually look at the web map or web scene and see what's going on behind the scenes. And it's just not magic, it's just a JSON definition. Okay, and I think I'm gonna just, I think we have a survey slide and we probably have time for questions. So let me just go to that survey slide. So we'd appreciate it if you take the survey. Um, it'll help us make the session better next year. If we covered something you don't care about, let us know. If we didn't cover something you really wish we had, let us know and we can try and do a better job next year. So I think we have a few minutes for questions if people have them. Everybody's hungry. All right, oh yeah. So you're saying you're saying that you right now you have your security um, set up using just your are you just hitting the REST API endpoint? Is that it? Yeah. You're asking how it works in Forex or? Yeah, we go through online and then we flip that. So you're asked, I, I'm still a little foggy on the question. If I located a web map from ArcGIS Online that has those types of layers, kind of like what's the best way to handle that? So if you're hitting, so this is um, layers that are not, they're not hosted layers, they're just, they're on your end, just within your own server, and they're locked down on your own end. So basically what would happen now I'm assuming I'm, I don't know offhand just without seeing it, but what I'm guessing is, is if you have these layers within your web map, they are locked down, do you, you, you get prompts then, is that correct? The identity manager, yeah. So basically what's happening under the hood now is that identity manager, it's getting, it's getting those error messages, those 404s that are coming back and saying, hey, I can't access this. It knows it needs to access secure content, so it's gonna prompt you for that username and password information. So, um, I mean, there's really nothing that's going to change on that end specifically with how 4X is gonna handle it. I mean, the security is, I mean, it's, pretty much this, it's gonna be the same. So it doesn't, like you're not, it, you're not using um, the OAuth model to handle that. So if you wanted to make it more seamless, I mean it would be something that, I don't know, again, without looking at your, your system. That goes down, yeah, we, I'd probably have to take that offline and we can talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, there's a lot, there's some things that we need to, you need to consider when you're doing some of that stuff. Uh-huh. Uh 
you know, the OAuth sign-in, we did some updates recently, um, moving some things around, so I would have to take a look at that as well and see the um, our lead developer it was supposed to be here, but he's sick. So um, I can take a look as well, but we can, I can just give me your information and your, um, the question and we can, we can go from there. Okay. Sure. So the question is the portal queries that the Azure request sample that we had that queries the portal, is there any op does it do the same work behind the scenes or is there any optimizations? So actually we could we could look. The way you could look is the the um, query items is just creating that request and sending it to the REST API for us. So we could open up the network traffic, we could run our sample app, we could look at that request that's going through look at the information that we send and the information that we get back, and I would expect it's doing the same kind of query without any necessary optimizations to that query. So it's using um, the REST API under the hood, and we can actually, you can actually pop open the network traffic and take a look at that. So you're asking if you can use OAuth to kind of set up almost like configurable type of apps, like show something for a specific person and... You want to take that? That's more like a configurable. Yeah, so yes, you can do that. And, and basically all you would do is in your code, you're just checking to see if someone's logged in. So when they're logged in, we get that credential. Um, and here we're we're checking to see if they have a if they have a credential or not, um, and if they don't, we get one. So you can always just check and see if there's a valid credential, and then you would just use CSS or you could dynamically import the module and add that widget at that point. So yep, you would just check if there's a credential. You could set up um, watches or event handlers to see when somebody clicks that and logs in, and then and you could check and say, oh, okay, we have a credential. We have somebody logged in. I can now display that widget or add that widget to the map. Yep, that's definitely possible. And just, you were talking about like the editor widget. Um, another thing to, um, I don't know if you've gone to any of the sessions, but there's a way to configure the editor widget, widget as well to only show specific layers for editing as well. So you might have editable layers, but if you want, like you have an app that you're creating, but you may not want specific, you know, them to go in and specific people to go in and hit these layers, you can set it so that they can't do it. Good question so far. Anybody else? Ah, oh, you guys are 623, awesome. And well, thanks for sticking with us. And you. you can take a few questions if you want to come up here, if you didn't want to answer. Generally, if not, have a good rest of the conference.